Okay, so today we are going to start with the AWS stuff. Um, so hopefully you were able to get through the Google Cloud, uh, the Thunder CTF. Um, so uh, today is our transition day over to AWS. Um, and uh, what I want to do is last week we went through how Google Cloud does its security stuff, the legacy stuff, and then the sort of native uh, cloud security. I'm going to do the exact same lecture, but give you the AWS side of it. Uh, it's slightly different. So we're going to talk about legacy security in the cloud with AWS. Um, and if you recall, this is the traditional server-based lift and shift. You're dealing with machines. You're dealing with IP addresses. You're dealing with the kinds of things that a normal IT uh, shop would be dealing with. Um, so Unix accounts, database accounts, SSH user accounts, uh, firewall keys, all that stuff. Uh, and then we're going to uh, show you how AWS does the cloud platform security uh, via IAM. Um, so uh, we'll first talk about how AWS does their what I call legacy security in the cloud. Uh, this isn't a common term, like you won't find this in books, but uh, informally people are talking about legacy cloud. And this is the kind of stuff they're talking about. Uh, because it's like a bunch of legacy junk just shifted over uh, into a cloud provider. Uh, so when we're dealing with machines in the cloud, uh, obviously we're uh, for, for Amazon, their equivalent to Compute Engine is EC2. And uh, when you start up an EC2 instance, if you've ever done this before, you get towards the end and they're like, hey, how do you want to access this virtual machine? And you're like, uh, we're not going to give you a username password because <laughs> that's like uh, totally 90s. Uh, we're going to give you an SSH key. It forces you into uh, saving a, an SSH private key. And so you say, oh, you know what? Okay, I, I can either choose one that I've established on AWS, or I can create an, a new one. So in this case, I have create me a new pair, and I'm going to name this pair ec2.ssh, and then uh, it'll give me a button that says download the private key. Now, when I download that private key, I better keep it in a safe place, and I better not delete it. Otherwise, I can't SSH uh, back into that thing. Um, so that's what the uh, UI looks like. Um, what I think is really annoying is uh, based on the kind of Unix you put on there, you have different user accounts that get established. So if you decide that you want the, uh, the Linux AMI, well, then the SSH key pair, when you use it, when you SSH into the Linux AMI, you have to use it on EC2-user. And then if it's a Ubuntu instance, the user that gets created is Ubuntu. So um, typically the username is kept in the pair, so you can just SSH to the IP address of the EC2 instance. OK, uh, so uh, when you save that private key and you want to SSH back into that instance, uh, this is what you'll do. So SSH-I, say, hey, I want the key to come from this private key file. So when you've downloaded it, it will download it into a .pem file, and then you do an ssh-i, and then you get onto that virtual machine. Now, I think uh, uh, a AWS has tried to make a, a clicky version of the SSH button like Google has. I haven't gotten that to work. <laughs> so if you have figured out how to get that thing to work, good on you. <laughs> Because I've tried multiple times, I'm still doing this stuff. So, all right. But I know, I know people have gotten it to work. So I'm, I'm just pointing that out to you. Um, SQL databases. This is very similar to Cloud SQL. I create a server. I want it to run some kind of database backend. It could be MySQL, Postgres SQL. Uh, it could be uh, MS SQL. It could be Oracle, MariaDB. You name it. Uh, RDS has got it. And then as you're setting up this instance, you'll get stuff like this. What is the username for that database, the, for, the, for the master account? What is the password? And then when you set that up, this is an, ex, uh, an example of Postgres. You can see you can just access that backend using the typical Postgres uh, CLI. So and it'll give you exactly like you would if you had, had that server running next to you. OK. Um, and so you see here the database, the password, the IP address, and then this is the magical Postgres port that the database server uh, listens on. And then you can specify the database name that you're trying to access. 
And uh, if you use that within your application, it'll connect up there and allow you to do the SQL queries uh, through that connection, which is what these database connector things are if you're like, running Java or you know, some kind of application that's hitting a back-end relational database. This is the connection to that database that you can send SQL statements uh, to. Okay. Um, firewall rules. Uh, so, uh, hang on a second. This is an old slide. Okay, so this is the slide I wanted. Um, so when we talk about firewall rules, uh, if you recall in Google Cloud, we had those network tags, those target tags that we basically define filtering on. Uh, in AWS, they're called security groups. So here's an example of a bunch of different security groups, and then there's a picture of a, of a wall, a brick wall for their firewall, and then you specify the kinds of access from external networks that you want to allow onto your internal AWS project. Yeah. Uh, so uh, arbitrarily typing in what name? Uh, the uh, like, like, like in, like in, uh, like in uh, GCC, like uh, PDX80, I think we called it. We called it PDX80, yep. Right. So that's just what we're referring to. Yeah, so the PDX80 tag is a version of, on Google Cloud, you're like, hey, I have a bunch of these rules, and then if I have a virtual machine that I want to have adopt those rules, I will just use that tag name. Uh, and the same idea for security group. Hey, I have this security group. I want this group to apply to any VM that wants those rules. Uh, so in this case, say I have a VM and I want HTTP, SSH, and RDP to get through. Well, then I can just use this. Uh, and that's, those are the things that get through and everything else is blocked off. I would name this some kind of security group. And then every VM that I want this kind of configuration for, I would just attach it. So, same idea, different terminology, um, so it's good to associate. This is the only way you're going to keep it straight, is to do some kind of analogous thinking between the two platforms. Um, and uh, what you can do is when you launch that EC2 instance, they will give you an option. So step number six says configure a security group. So if you've already set up a security group with the exact kinds of settings you want, you could actually associate it here. But here's an example of a security group uh, that I create. Uh, so say I only want SSH access to, um, to be allowed for Portland state ranges. So this, this is um, you know, allowing incoming SSH on port 22, which is the SSH port. And then everything else, this is a web server that I want to configure. Everything else uh, is allowed access to the web port. So that's just an example of the equivalent thing in AWS that you would find in in um, uh, Google Cloud as well. Okay, uh, questions about that? It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty dry stuff, so I don't want to. I don't want to belabor this stuff. Uh, this is this is stuff that hopefully. Um, well, if you like this stuff, go for it. But this is stuff that most people don't really care too much about. Um, so I'm going to shift over to the new stuff, the cloud platform security stuff, uh, through uh, AWS's IAM. Um, so this is what we're going to cover for the rest of this. Uh, so in AWS, in terms of identity, there is a what's called a root account on an AWS project. And this is the email address of whatever AWS account uh, you have. And uh, this is not done through anything fancy like Google does with the OAuth thing. It's not like an email address that's native well, Amazon doesn't really have like a portal that Google has, so it's, it's not done via that. Amazon has its own account uh, system, and then you create that root account. Uh, and then uh, it's typically done via email address, and you, when you create this thing, this root account is typically not used for development. You want to almost immediately, and in fact, if you do any AWS certification, it's like, you better know that you want to delete the root account credentials off of your project because you don't want anybody using that, really. You want to be able to do something different, which we'll, we'll talk about later. So that is the, this is similar to the owner, or the, I mean, the root account is similar to, I mean, it has privileges of the owner, 
but it's also equivalent to your project ID in Google Cloud. Because that is, it's sort of the umbrella that's going to hold all of your AWS resources underneath. Um, and so this is typically given an AWS account ID. So in, on Google Cloud, we have an, a project name and a project ID. Uh, on AWS, we have this uh, AWS account ID. And then we are allowed, as the root account, to set an alias up in case we don't want to have to remember our account ID. So I don't want to remember my account ID, so I set up an alias. Uh, and, and that's basically this. You can consider the alias similar to your project name on Google Cloud. OK, so the example, uh, so for my AWS account, on, on it, it's done with this email address. This is my account ID. Uh, so you'll see this account ID when we look at all the AWS like policies and stuff, because the policies are written against your uh, account number. Uh, but then I have this, this alias, AWS PDX, that you will use to uh, sort of, like when you want to, if you, well, if, if you were on my project as a user, you would use the AWS PDX sign-in to get access to that project. Okay, so this is what it looks like. There's two kinds of logins. So when you get to sign into AWS, you can get confused because there's like, there's this IAM lo login and then there's the root account login. And so like, which one is which? So if you are trying to sign in as the root account, when you see this root user sign in, this is the owner account. And so you'll see, uh, I, uh, I'll put in my owner account, and then I have a password associated with it. Um, it also is the case that after I create my, my root account, within that root account, I can start creating a bunch of user accounts. This is very similar to Linux. I have the root account, and then I need a bunch of users. So if like, I want the entire classroom as part of my uh, AWS project, I would create one per student. Now I would have 45 user, IAM user accounts. But these accounts are local to the project itself. That means the only IAM user login that you can use your credentials on is my project. This is not like Google Cloud. Like I could have a dozen projects on Google Cloud and I can just say your own ID at pdx.edu can be viewers on all of them. I can't do that on AWS. On AWS, I gotta go through every, all 10 account IDs that I have and manually add your user. So that is, that is a little bit different between Google Cloud and AWS, and that's one of the reasons I prefer the Google Cloud way, but. Uh, how about permissions? Uh, we'll talk about permissions. Yeah, they're a little bit different as well. Um, and so, yeah, when I say contrast this to single sign-on with OAuth 2, if you think about Google Cloud user management to your project, it's just done by email address, right? like that, that can authenticate over OAuth 2. I don't have to actually explicitly go into my project and say, I gotta configure a username and password for a particular IAM user. In this case, you do. Like when you go and you create an IAM user on your project, well, you don't have, you don't have a real project uh, through AWS Educate, but if you got a real AWS account and you wanted to add someone someone's access, you would go in there and say, hey, create an IAM user, and it'll ask you, what do you want the default username and password to be? And then you would email that to that person. So account management on a project is a little bit, I think, more difficult on AWS. Uh, but part of the reason is AWS was the, first, was the first to the market, and this was before a lot of that OAuth stuff really was mature. And so Google's got the advantage of starting later. <laughs> Yeah, OAuth wasn't, maybe it was a pipe dream in someone's head, uh, but like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is them selling off access markets. Yeah. So anyway, contrast the thing you saw in the last slide. So that's the root user sign-in. If I gave you access to my uh, account as an IAM user, then you would go to the IAM login. And then you would say, hey, uh, the alias, I'm trying to log into AWS PDX, and say, I have a Cloud Goat IAM user on my project, and it would just be Cloud Goat and whatever password uh, I assign to that, that user, IAM user. And then I would just sign in, and it would give me a console. Um, OK. Um, I can also create groups. And unlike Google, where it's just done through Google Groups, 
where I have this nice UI that's standard across all my groups, you have a special group UI underneath uh, AWS that says, oh, administrators, minimal, and then students, and then you would be able to attach different IAM policies to each one of them to do whatever secure, uh, least privileged sort of access to, to them. Okay, uh, so there are two kinds of IAM authorization policies. I mentioned this briefly when we talked about the Google Cloud stuff. The most common way of doing access control in the cloud is through these identity-based policies. Uh, and so your authorization is attached to your identity. So here are some examples. Um, you basically have these policies that say for particular identities, I'm going to allow particular actions on specific resources. So here is an example of Carlos has only access to resource X, and these are the actions that are allowed. And then Richard has Y and Z access, and then the managers, which is a role or a group, uh, have uh, X, Y, and Z. And then they all have different permissions. And so you would attach these uh, policies, basically, to either uh, groups or specific users. That's, that's typically how we do it. Yeah. Um, what about 3,000 plus in Google? Oh, yeah. So that, there's only three columns here. It doesn't even tell you what that read, write, and list is for. But like, if you go to the AWS services thing, there's a whole bunch of read, write, and listing that you can do on every single one of those services. So yeah, this is a simplified version. But you basically have this enormous matrix uh, of permissions that you would have to navigate. And we're stuck with this. So it's like, you, you can't just complain about it and think it'll go away. We're stuck with it. We, gotta, we have to figure out as a society, because we're all depending on this stuff, right? How to figure this stuff out. I mean, yeah, there's no way around it. Um, uh, the other thing you'll find is resource-based uh, authorization policies, and this is typically done, I didn't really go through this in the Google Cloud stuff, because you'll mostly see this on the AWS stuff. Um, the authorizations can be associated with the resource, and then, uh, then you would sort of combine both the identity-based stuff with the resource-based stuff to determine whether or not someone has access. Uh, it's just more convenient sometimes to attach the policy to the resource rather than the identity. So a different way of looking at access control. Um, so here's an example, uh, and this is typically done for uh, uh, storage, like storage buckets. You're like, oh, you know what, I want to take resource X, and I just want to explicitly identify who has access to that, that resource, or resource Y. So it's just a different way of of specifying your policy. And uh, IAM, AWS's IAM allows you very expressive uh, ways of, of doing policy. So you can do either, either of these two. And this is where some of the complexity comes in, right? Like the more expressive your language is, the harder it is to do it right. Uh, yes. Bucket, bucket um, the only ones I have seen have been on storage bucket uh, level. And actually, Google does do storage bucket level permissions as well. They just started adding that kind of stuff. Did you have a question, Jacob? Are we going to have a lab that centers around misconfigured IAM policies? In fact, today, that is your, your in-class lab. It's going to be really simple. Uh, uh, yeah, in fact, the next two weeks, we're going to have all sorts of misconfigured stuff that we're going to rifle through. Uh, so yeah, and I know some people have already started, uh, but yeah, we, I'll, I'll get to what we're doing in the next couple of weeks, but we'll be, we'll be looking at all of this stuff uh, underneath the hood, for better or for worse. Okay, so uh, in terms of identity-based policies, this is very similar to what you just saw uh, with Google Cloud. You have pro policies that specify actions on cloud resources, and these policies can be attached either to a user or a group or a role. And if you attach it to a role, the role can be associated with a user or a group. So there's a lot of flexibility in terms of specifying the kinds of permissions you want people to have and who can attach, or how do you attach those permissions to that, that actor. Uh, typically, they recommend in a lot of the trainings that you never attach a policy directly to an IAM user. What you would do, the better, policy, the better way of doing this thing, is to attach the policy based on the role of that user. 
and then assign the user to that role so that when the user's role change changes, you're not sitting there individually updating the user's permissions. So that, that's traditionally what you want to do if you had the druthers of setting up your AWS account project on your own. Almost none of you will get out into the real world and have the ability to do this, uh, which is unfortunate actually, because I, I went to this talk where they, like, the developers set up the, I, the AWS account. And so as soon as the developer get, developers get their hands on the AWS root, root account, they're never going to give up the permissions, even though it's better for them too. Like you need someone who, yeah, so whoever sets that thing up at the beginning needs to, to structure the security right. Otherwise, you're hosed, like you're as an organization. Uh, and that, but that's just my opinion. Okay, so here's an example scenario. Uh, so you, uh, this is a, an identity-based policy that you attach to a particular group, and it specifies the kind of access that you might have to individual storage buckets. So maybe full access for this group to this particular bucket, but then only read-only access for another bucket. And then you would be able to, when that access occurs, you would apply the, you go through the policies and apply it and figure out what's allowed, and then either allow or deny that, that request. Is, yeah. that, is that listed um, like as an admin or whatever? Like, if you're looking at it, you would just look at that and like pre-structure it? Um, so if you are the admin and you have been given IAM policy read access, uh, you can go through, and you would, <laughs> as an admin, you would go and you could see the, the policies that are associated with each of these users uh, per group, yeah. In fact, you would want to periodically audit that group to make sure that the, uh, the access level on that group is reasonable, yeah. Yeah, or hasn't been changed, for example. <laughs> so yeah, who would change those, who would change those permissions? I don't know who would do that. I don't know anyone. Um, so uh, the example policies, and I want to give you some example. I like showing concrete examples because if it's too abstract, you, you won't remember any of it. Um, so here are some examples of policies uh, that specify permissions. And these are ones you're actually going to see in, in some of your labs. Uh, so here's one. Um, this particular policy is some role. They call it a AWS Lambda Basic Execution Role. And they attach this particular uh, permission to it that says uh, the CloudWatch, so you remember the logging backend for AWS, is called you know, CloudWatch and CloudTrail are the two logging services. I want to be able to do write access to the logs, right? Like so I have a Lambda, and any of the errors, I want to be able to write out to CloudWatch. Notice I don't have read access. Uh, do you remember the uh, Google Cloud one where that, that, that node got read access to the log files and then emitted the private information into the log files only to read it. So this is what you want, right? This is typically, you know, you should only ever append only to a log and then you should never be able to read it on that instance. There should never be a case where, well, maybe there is one, but like it should be rare that you would actually need that piece of software to go and read the log files uh, after the fact. Okay. Here's another one that says, oh, for this service, allow access. Uh, so here's a policy. If I attach it to a piece of software or a user or a group, it says allow DynamoDB access, and then you can do read and write, but you can't delete, for example, on this, on this role. Um, and then here's another one. Allow full S3 access, another policy. And you can attach these policies, multiple ones, to a particular user to allow that user to have all of these things or, or a particular uh, application if you want. So in this case, lead, uh, th this, this ca in this case, you get S3 with list, read, write, permissions, management. It's, uh, so this is basically full access to that bucket. Okay. Um, when you start looking at AWS permission policies, uh, the, there's this notion of AWS resource names. These are basically URIs for every single resource on AWS. Like everything that exists on AWS has a name associated with it, and that's the ARN. Uh, so you'll see when I say I have a policy that specifies actions on a resource, the resource isn't, is specified by an ARN on the other side. 
And so this is the general structure of an ARN. Uh, so ARN, partition, the service that's being accessed, the region that it's being accessed in, the account ID. So my account uh, ID would be on, on a lot of your policies that you are going to filter through uh, this uh, in, in the Cloud Goat Labs, and then the actual resource in that project ID. So that's how it's, it's, it's specified, yeah. Oh, so the triple colon, so anytime, so this happens a lot in, um, in networking. Uh, the triple colon means that all the fields that are in between there are unspecified. And so if you don't want to, like there's a bunch of fields in the ARN, and sometimes you don't want to specify them, or they're not relevant to the ARN that you're naming, and you would just leave that field null. Uh, and then, I didn't, uh, if you've taken the networking class and looked at IPv6 addresses, there's a whole bunch of triple colons there, because they're like, I don't want to write a bunch of zeros out, because there are too many octets. That's the idea with the, with the different colons in this, in this ARN. Uh, any other questions about the ARN? Okay. Here is an example, so just to get into the details of this, of an identity-based IAM policy. And you look, and it's basically a JSON object that you can parse out. Uh, so here it uh, gives you a version number. One of the things about policies is that it's version just like Git. So every time you create a new version of a policy, it gets saved. It has its own, every policy has its own ARN. When you create a new one to replace it, it just gets a new version number. Uh, yes, we'll be doing that today, in fact. You can access the old one. So, uh, yeah, well, no, this is, so uh, a lot of this content is targeted for you to understand the labs that you're doing. So, yes, we will be talking about ARNs and then going back in time on policies, yeah. You, yeah, I think so. You're right. Yeah, that's probably one of the motivations because if something happens to you, you need to know the exact state. They need to know. They need to know. Yeah, you need so that they, they can, like, if you want to be a compliant to any kind of regulations, you would. Oh, is that what you're having to do? Yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's correct. So you, yeah, and, and we'll, um, when we do flaws two, or when you do flaws two, the defender path, it is critical that you be able to recreate exactly what happened on the back end. This is how you do attribution. Like, you, like when, if all of that logging information has been tampered with, it's really hard to do attribution. So when they're talking about attributing cyber attacks to like Russia or China, they're having to go filter through exactly what, what happened, the, the post-mortem. And you have to have a high fidelity audit trail in order to do that. So that's what, that's what you're, um, that's why you save everything. Um, okay, so uh, what does this IAM policy say? It says, hey, uh, the action that I want to uh, provide is an allow policy that uh, allows these actions. So uh, basically, uh, login profile, accessing the login profile, accessing the access key, uh, the SSH public key, and uh, I want to allow these actions on this particular resource. So, and then there's the ARN. So th that is exactly how you would specify a policy. And this would get attached to some user. You note that the, it doesn't identify an actual identity because this, you're going to use this policy and attach it to either groups, uh, users, you name it. Okay. Uh, here's an example of a resource-based policy. Um, so if I want to um, specify particular principles have access to particular resources, I can create something like this and then attach it to a storage resource. So in this case, only one AWS uh, account ID, uh, 11112222233, has access to my bucket. Okay. Um, you might see one or two of those in your, in your labs. Okay, uh, there is a, an algorithm for specifying policies. Uh, so yeah, you can see this is gonna get pretty complex, but I'm not gonna show you all this complexity. Uh, there's a flow chart that says, hey, I've got a bunch of policies. How am I gonna apply all of these different things to figure out whether or not a particular access is allowed or denied? I have identity policies, I have resource policies, I have actions that are deny, I have actions that are allow. 
So the way AWS does this is through this specific flowchart, which you would have to know. It does all of, it goes through the policy, regardless of how the thing is ordered, and it pulls out all the explicit deny rules. Applies those first. If you have been explicitly denied, if you fall under any of those explicit deny rules, you're immediately denied. And then it goes and it goes through all the rules to see whether or not you're explicitly allowed in any of those rules. And then the default is denied. So that's the, that's the AWS algorithm, uh, or the policy application. Uh, so here's an example. Um, so you see an allow policy at the top, you see a deny policy at the bottom. The only thing I want you to know is that the deny policy gets started first. So deny everything that's not this resource, deny access, straight up, doesn't matter who you are. Um, so just deny all of this and then allow on this particular policy specific resource access. And in, in, in this case it's polynotes, which I, I don't even know what that is. I think it's a text to speech thing is what polynotes is. Um, that emits a, uh, an MP3 file. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is how AWS would like you to set up your project in the ideal world. Uh, and I just want to show this to you because you'll come across this. If you want to get certified in any of the AWS stuff, they'll want you to know that this is the way they want you to do it. Uh, so here is an example where uh, uh, you create, someone, uh, so may, hopefully like the CEO or the CFO creates the root account, uh, and we'll call uh, the person in this case is Maria, and then her company's AWS root account gets created on her email address, uh, and then this is the account that shouldn't be used for day-to-day -day operations. You don't want to use this root account. Uh, what she does is instead she creates her own IAM user on this account, and then uh, she gives herself complete administrator access on that, on that account, which is what you would want. And then she creates an admin group. And this admin group also uh, has this uh, role, a full, a full access role attached to it. And then she adds herself to that. Uh, so now um, uh, she's, uh, she sort of uh, built this stuff underneath the root account. And then she hires Joe. And Joe is a budding system administrator, doesn't know a thing about least privileges. And so Maria doesn't want to give him any access to any of the policy creation uh, things that you just saw earlier. So until that person can be trusted to create least privileged policies, they're not given access. Uh, meanwhile, Maria, um, uh, wants Joe to do the management of accounts. So say, for example, as part of setting up this company's account, she creates an analyst uh, group. So she wants to be able to hire a bunch of analysts to go through the account's logs, for example, to do some data science. So <coughs> she'll create this analyst uh, group and then attach a policy that gives it very limited access, basically access to maybe the CloudWatch or the cloud trail uh, stuff. And then she allows Joe, Joe can't create policy, but he can assign, he's given the ability to assign users to groups. And so what Joe will do is it'll, uh, Joe is gonna hire a bunch of people and then uh, a, a bunch of analysts, and then just add those analysts straight to that, to that group. And so Maria can sort of delegate some of the user account administration without giving up the farm in terms of policy creation. Uh, yeah. Was the, was the group rule uh, over supersede, like if Maria was part of that group, would she have what the rules in place? Uh, she would. But she, she has multiple groups and roles. So that Joe could add himself to this group as well, but uh, it's superseded by the fact that he's already got a policy, a stronger policy attached. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, she repeats this for the developers. The developers get a little extra, it gets second check mark because they're actually manipulating platform resources. So yeah, they get an extra check mark and then different developers get assigned to that, that group, yeah. Is, is, that, is it backwards compatible? Like if, if say Mary uh, was, didn't have those permissions to begin with, if she was in that group, would she be granted those permissions? Yeah, unless there's an explicit deny, oh. I think, because the deny gets applied first. 
Yeah, I believe. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm no AWS expert. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, you could try that. If there is an explicit deny on there, that would supersede the, yeah, the allow. OK. Because it, it's exactly that flow chart. Right? If I don't specify it's deny, uh, if I explicitly allow it before an explicit deny, then it's OK. <clears throat> OK, uh, it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, so as part of the analyst role, Anna and Shirley are, are sitting there working, and then Maria's like, you know what? I'm hitting a project deadline. I need to give you ac additional access to cloud resources. So the way you would typically want to do this is to create a temporary role and then attach that role to both Anna and Shirley to get the elevated access that they need to do that, to, to hit that project deadline. And then when that project is over, you would delete the role. And then that is a clean way of managing the permissions so you're not left with an intractable set of permissions that it got, got assigned to people. Okay, and it's clearly named as a temporary role to meet this scrum or this, this sprint. And, that's, and then you would just delete it after the sprint is over. Okay. Uh, similarly, if you hire a temporary developer for like a summer intern, then you would create a temporary intern role for that summer, give it the appropriate permissions as a developer, but then know to delete that thing after the summer's over so that the, uh, the account goes away. And then obviously you'd want to delete the, the developer account too, but this will let, let you wipe all of them out. Yeah. And the, the temporary, is that built into AWS? Um, no. <laughs> this is just a name. <laughs> uh -huh. But yeah, you would want to, I'm sure they have management uh, software that would allow you to say, create this role for this amount of time, but I don't think it's actually written into the policy to self-destruct. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but if someone sees a self-destructing policy, let me know. But I, I would imagine there's a there's like a cottage industry of managing security stuff in the cloud. I would imagine that might be part of. Yeah, it might be a good idea. All right, so that's how that's how it's intended to work. Yeah. This temp role gives Shirley and Anna more privileges. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think, it, like, if it's, if they have been explicitly denied, so f say for example, they were using a service, they were abusing the ML service to mine Bitcoin, uh, you would say, okay, I'm going to explicitly deny the ML services, and then if this role got attached that says, hey, I need you to work on the ML stuff, the explicit deny would hold first, I believe. Um, yeah, so the explicit denies are always done first. And then uh, you have the implicit deny. If nothing has been labeled all the way to the bottom, it's an implicit deny. So that's what these things are assuming. There's an implicit deny at the bottom. Uh, there is no explicit denies here. But if, it did, if, if the person did have an explicit, explicit deny, then it could not be overruled by a green check mark that said allow again, because the evaluation would stop, right? As soon as the first explicit deny denies that access, it should, it should stop. So yeah. I hope you don't give Joe an uh, explicit deny. Yeah. An implicit deny. So she, so actually, yeah, Maria might have given Joe an explicit deny on the policy. No, no, it, either way, it would have been fine, like implicit or explicit. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, if it's explicit and he's not allowed to go and edit that thing, then he's stuck. Yeah. Okay. Um, you won't be you won't be navigating this too. I just put this up there because this is a, something you'll eventually see uh, in AWS. But I don't think we're gonna do we're not gonna do a lot of this stuff in your um, your your exercises. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about. So that those are the policies. How do I embody those policies in terms of uh, authorizing access. Well, as it turns out, uh, the the way AWS does this, uh, so if you have, for example, an application that needs to authenticate its access to any AWS service, this is typically done with something called an AWS access key ID. 
Uh, and then as part of this access key ID, you have your private AWS secret access key that says, if I have these two things, uh, so the way this works is AWS is going to issue these things to you. And by, uh, by supplying these two values on an access to AWS, you can assume the roles that have been attached to whatever those access keys have been bound to. So if I have, if Maria wants to be able to programmatically access all of the AWS resources, she'll get an access key ID and a secret access key for her account. And then she'll want to keep those secret because those are going to be used to authenticate programmatic access to the backend services on AWS. Um, yeah. So does the root get that too, or does AWS stay away from that? This is the very first thing they tell you is delete the root account credentials. Delete the access key for the root account. Delete the secret. Like delete all of that, because that, that should not. Uh, in fact, you can say, do not allow any access key uh, access for particular accounts. So for particular IAM users, you can say disallow console login or disallow access key uh, access to your project. So that's the, that's the kind of flexibility that, that AWS is going to give you. But uh, even on the enterprise level, you still have the potential yeah, Oh, yeah. Well, you've got lots of potential vulnerabilities because uh, there's a lot of things to cover here uh, in terms of, hey, what happens if I issue an access key? And uh, that person used it and cut and pasted it on a notepad somewhere. Uh, I got to make sure I rotate that access key. And then so AWS has got ways of always rotating these things so that when, you know, heaven forbid, someone coughs up their access key, it's not persistent access over long, basically forever. So you'll see that this rotation, this key, key management system, uh, there, it's both in AWS and Google Cloud. I'm not going to cover it. But you have to think about this, like that JSON file that you were using. Like, what happened? Like, is that good forever? It shouldn't be. You should have a way of timing out those credentials because this is all just, a, you know, some kind of value that you're hoping is secret but might not be. And so you'll see that there are uh, these things will rotate uh, eventually. <clears throat> these keys can expire. You can actually set. Uh, you can actually use some of the AWS services to actually go and rotate some of these keys because you don't want to do this manually. Like if I like if, if all of these users have these access keys, uh, you don't want to go in there and manually uh, refresh the key, and you don't want to rely on the user to always have to do that. Uh, but what you would do instead is you would in the IAM sort of the, in the IAM CLI, you're able to expire these things and rotate them. And, and issue new ones. So key rotation is something in cryptography you want to do you, because of the chance of them getting exposed. Yeah. Okay, but we're not really going to do a lot of key rotation here, but just know that it is a thing uh, because you can never be sure that this credential, in fact, we'll be using these kinds of credentials all throughout the next couple of weeks, uh, and you'll see that you'll need to get fresh ones. So it's not as, it doesn't rotate as quickly as those tokens, so someone was saying you got pretty good at access tokens. Well, uh, it, won't, it won't rotate as quickly as that, but they will rotate. Um, like I know, like I, had, I had some of the Cloud Goat levels deployed from last summer, and I had to redeploy them because the access keys uh, rotated out from underneath me. OK, um, so yeah, uh, this was, yeah, should never be issued on root account credentials. You should never have an access key that allows you uh, to do project-wide uh, stuff. OK. Um, so this is, if you have this access key and the secret uh, key, uh, key information, then the way you configure the AWS command line is very similar to the, the G Cloud command line. You want to associate an identity to all the commands that you're issuing in the CLI. And the way you do that is through this thing called AWS configure. And you can say, uh, configure me a profile and I'm going to name it. I'm going to name it, in this case, the serverless hack me profile. Um, and then what this will do is it will create a, a profile in your tilde.aws credentials directory that will store that pair uh, in, in, the, in the directory. So that, this is where all your credentials get stored in your home directory slash .aws slash credentials. It's just a text file. Um, and then if you peek into that text file, this is what it'll look like. 
you'll see uh, an access key ID variable, an access key, which is um, way bigger than this, but I'm just giving you just a, a, a brief snippet of it. And then sometimes if you got a, an OAuth token, like an identity token like you did in Google Cloud, you can actually attach that also to this profile for as long as that token is, uh, is valid. Okay. <clears throat> Um, if you want to specify a specific region uh, for all of your commands to operate in, it gets to be a pain to specify, oh, US West 1 or US East 1. Uh, you can specify the default region on all of the AWS CLI commands, and that's stored in this directory. You'll see when you, when you do this command, um, it steps you through uh, the access key ID, the secret access key, and the region information. And so there will be a profile here that says for this profile, serverless hack me, the default region is US East 1, so you don't have to specify uh, that in the command line anymore. Okay, so then uh, you're going to be using the CLI a lot in the next couple of weeks, and the CLI is used to, uh, you can use it to activate different profiles to run whatever AWS command you, you're looking to, to run. So in this case, uh, I have two profiles in my, uh, I've configured two profiles. I named one default and I named another one production uh, prod. And then say I want to use the production credentials to list the buckets in the production bucket. Then what I'll do is I'll do the AWS S3 LS on that bucket and I'll specify which profile I'm going to use to supply the credentials. And that's what this thing is. Okay, so you'll, You'll, your credentials file will have a bunch of profiles at the end of this, these two weeks. You'll probably have like a dozen different profiles uh, that you'll be using um, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, uh, the next thing is identity tokens. <clears throat> so this is very similar to getting the OAuth tokens from uh, the Google Cloud, the Thunder CTF thing. Uh, so the way it's done in AWS is through this security token service or STS. So when you type AWS STS, you're accessing the token service to try and issue you a token that's very similar to the gcloud auth print identity token. So the equivalent in AWS is to go to STS and say, get me a uh, get caller identity or something like that, and it'll give you a token. Um, and this is the thing, um, if you see before this AWS session token, when you see this, this is basically the same token that you get out of the uh, STS service. And this is, again, for API access. So, so authenticating uh, APIs is typically done using a, a session token. And then the API will be able to validate that that token is uh, what it is. Okay, okay so uh, access key and token handling. You'll be doing this a lot in your labs. Uh, obviously, you have to practice. You, you have to protect your access key. You have to protect your tokens, um, and typically, you would not a want to put it in your code. It should not show up in your Python files. Uh, it should not show up in your Git repositories. It should not be somewhere where people can actually pull the keys. Uh, and we talked about people scanning Git for uh, AWS uh, access keys. Uh, people are forgetting all the time, and it's ending up there. Um, uh, typically, what I've seen is that you would pass these in as environment variables. So uh, if, you, if you're familiar with containers, one of the things you can do with a container, when you start up a container, you can say, you know what, I want the account that's going to run uh, that container to have a certain set of environment variables. I'm just going to pass the access keys through those environment variables. So yes, if uh, it, it doesn't show up on in the, in the file system is the idea, okay? So here's an example of running a Docker container where you specify the environment variables and then these special environment variables can be pulled from whatever application is running in the container to get authenticated to AWS services. Okay, so yeah, the access key ID, the default access key, the region, and then if you have this, you can actually specify the session token, although I've never seen a Docker container started with a session token before, uh, but you could set these all in environment variables. Uh, and then it, on the container itself, if you go and you log into the container and you do a print end and you grep out AWS, you can see the access key stuff in the, in the um, environment. 
Um, and so these are, these are sitting there in memory. So if your container gets hijacked, uh, the adversary can do a print env, or they can do in, in Linux, the proc file system has a pointer to your current process in proc self, and you can dump the environment of the current process using this command. And then you can see, there it is, the AWS access key is sitting there in memory. This will be one of your labs. Uh, so when you have a so when we talk about having a vulnerable web app, and then you can get code execution on it, this would be the the command that an adversary would want to run to pull out your access key ID, and then use. So when you get this access key, you are now the service account, or you're you're now the IAM user that's running that container. So if that container has access to all the S3 buckets in your project. By knowing this, you have access to all the S3 buckets in that project as well. So this is where you really need least privileges to happen on these uh, access keys, yeah. Read them in and store them as, store them in as, con I mean, they're all sitting there in memory, right? Like at some point, you gotta use the darn thing. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so um, some of you have taken the cloud course. Uh, so the way I've seen it done in Kubernetes is that the Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster manager holds the keys. So you would have to break that to get the keys and then it passes the environment variables into any of the, the nodes that are running. Um, but then yeah, if you comp compromise one of the nodes and pull the key out of that, then you have that, that access key in memory. Like, because yeah, it's hard. Like that access key has to be stored somewhere on that machine. So if you have access, root access to that machine, it's hard to hide. It's hard to hide an access key there. Um, okay, so that's one way of sending access key and tokens uh, into a, a running uh, process that needs them. Um, the other way is through what's called a metadata service. We've already referred to this a couple of times. Uh, the metadata service can be accessed using just HTTP. Okay, so what is this? Um, so the motivation of the metadata service is, to, so I wanna step back and motivate how we're deploying stuff in the cloud. Typically, when you start a virtual machine, you don't have a, a, a server sitting there all to yourself. Like some of these servers, they have 96 cores in them. And you're gonna, you're gonna start up a, an EC2 instance and maybe use one of them. So this is typically what you have running in the cloud. You have some hypervisor on a, so this is one machine has a hypervisor, and the hypervisor is switching across multiple virtual machines that are multiplexed on the hypervisor. So you see different customers, one, two, and three, they all have different roles on this virtual machine, and they're all running separate uh, EC2 hosts. Um, so you want to be able to provide access keys for each one of those machines, right? Each machine has a different access key for a different set of privileges on the backend infrastructure. Uh, and so here's an example of what you would want to have happen. You would want some metadata service, which is here on the bottom. You want that thing to basically get an access from a customer with a particular role and you want this customer to be able to say, you know what, I need to get my temporary credentials because I wanna use these credentials to access the S3 service. And so we talked about how uh, these are services in AWS and if you're, if you're trying to access these services using, for example, an API, then you would wanna do something like, I need an identity token. I need an access token so that I can use that access token on S3 to authenticate. And so the role of the metadata service is rather than force the getting the token code into the customer, there is a standard way that the, that the, uh, the customer can access this metadata service to, to have the metadata service issue the token. Okay, so that's, that's what this is, is to get the credentials, return these credentials to the customer so that they can then use it from the application out to the, AW, the rest of the AWS resources. So that is typically what you want. Uh, the way this is implemented is this picture. 
So within the hypervisor, there is a protected metadata service that knows about all the different roles and all the different accounts that are running on top of it. And then when you access that magic URL, uh, this thing will know which credentials are associated with you so that you can then use that to get the S3 access. Okay. Keep everything in the hypervisor for that. For, and this is, yeah, this is the picture of what's going on. And so this, yes, and so this, these are well-known local private IP addresses that you will use from, from these VMs. You hit that URI, and it'll, it'll talk to the metadata service. So that's, this is similar to what Google has. Google, the metadata, metadata.google.internal is basically this. This is actually an open stack standard. This is not something that AWS or Google came up with uh, as a bright idea. This was something that was standardized because you're, you're, you want people to run a standard stack and then be able to write software against it. This was their mechanism of having sort of a, a uh, platform agnostic way of getting credentials to and from uh, the hypervisor and, and doing the authentication. Okay. So this is often the target of attack. So when we have an SSRF like you have done already on Google Cloud, that's the reason why this thing is being targeted with SSRF. Because that URI, that IP address, has no meaning in the public internet. That is not a routable IP address. Uh, like if I do this, if I click on, on that link, it'll, Portland State's gonna be like, what the heck, that's, that's like nothing. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna give you access to that, but on here, these are magic IP addresses that will hit this metadata service. Okay, so if you have a web proxy here, uh, you can give it that URL and you can get this thing. So that's the SSRF to get the, uh, uh, the access token. Okay, questions? Yeah, you'll be doing this one. There's several levels in AWS land that'll, that'll, that'll be that. So here's an example of what you're gonna be getting at. <laughs> so here's that link, latest metadata, and you can see the AMI that got launched. You can get all the IAM information, the host name. Uh, all of this stuff uh, is available to you. Um, the public keys, uh, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot there. Okay, so now I think you have enough to be able to make sense of all the labs. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the labs and then uh, let you get at it. Uh, there are, and this is going to be done over the next two weeks, there are four labs. The first three, serverless, goat, flaws.cloud, and flaws2.cloud, you can do those outside of class. Uh, those are uh, walkthroughs that don't rely on me doing anything. So go off and do those on your spare time, or if you manage to do the in-class lab quickly, you can use the rest of the class to finish off those things. Uh, the, the last uh, code lab, Cloud Goat, these, this one has to be done in class. So I need, because I can only launch these things one at a time, I need you to be here to finish them. Uh, because these things are gonna go get taken down almost immediately after class, or I might, I might give you an hour or two after class, but the goal is to finish these so that I can change it to the next level. Um, the other thing about these things is that you might be given permissions to destroy things on that project. Please don't. <laughs> um, I can reissue things, but I, I, basically it's gonna prevent people from finishing it, especially this first one. Um, and this first one will take you like two minutes to do, so there'll be plenty of time. So if you're freaking out about finishing this lab, this one's the super easy one. And then right after this class, I'm gonna deploy this one, and you can actually do some work ahead of time to try and get through it, and then I'll finish off next class uh, and then switch to the next level. So these two are synchronized, the Cloud Breach and the EC2 SSRF ones. And then this one I'm gonna do in class as well, but I'm gonna leave it up. It's the last one of the sequence. Okay. Uh, yeah, the level. Yeah, the uh, yeah every like the when I want. So all of these. So actually, if you have your own AWS account, a full fledged one, not this Vocarium thing, you could run these yourself if you wanted to. Um, the problem is, is that when you, when I when you have mo like forty five people trying to do the exact same level on the exact same infrastructure, there are some things that just will break uh, because you're you're modifying the project in order to get to stuff. 
I can't have 45 people modifying stuff to get stuff. So I've walked through these things, and I hope I've done enough of the walkthrough that I know that you're not going to step on each other. Uh, these are levels that you can do non-destructively. <laughs> so th th this is, but I want to make sure that uh, uh, it makes sense to do these one at a time, because if I launch all of them, and you go and you try and investigate the project, you'll see hundreds of things that are up there uh, from all the different ones, and you'll just get really confused. So this is what I'm doing, and I hope it works. This is the first time I've done this, so I'm hoping it works, but uh, I might need to ask for your patience on, on some of these things. Okay, so um, with that, I'm going to show you the code labs. Um, so uh, you will see here um, the four AWS code labs. Well, wait, three? I have to reload. Hey, hang on a second. OK, so these are the four AWS serverless GOAT, flaws.cloud, flaws2.cloud, and then cloud GOAT. Uh, if you have not set up your AWS stuff before, uh, what I would want you to do is to do 4.2, the first, the first part of 4.2. So there are three ways I give you to set up the AWS CLI. The very first way is the easiest, and that is to get onto Linux Lab and do that. Uh, actually, I don't know if you can do the top two, but get into Linux Lab and do these bottom four. Right, because the AWS CLI is just a pack, uh, package in Python. So create a virtual environment, pip install the AWS CLI, and then you should be good to go. Um, so try that way. Um, if you like running on different things, uh, option number two is uh, to basically do this on EC2. So your accounts allow you to launch virtual machines. Anytime you launch a virtual machine, on AWS, it comes prepackaged with the AWS CLI. Uh, for I mean, it would be sad if you had to do a pip install or apt install of the CLI on an a on AWS instance. So uh, that's another way of doing it. Um, the third way, if you're a developer, uh, you can use Cloud9. So Cloud9 is that integrated IDE. Uh, so if you like GUIs, you, so the thing is with Cloud9, you're not going to use any of the development stuff. So it's like kind of a waste, but like it has an it has a AWS CLI shell in the bottom that you can use for this as well. Uh, where does it? Yeah. So that's those are the three different ways. Um, let's see here. Whoops, that's not what I want. Once you do that, this is the lab. So this is what I want you to do after I'm done here, and this should not take you very long at all. Uh, the first lab is this IAM privilege escalation by rollback. So we talked about how policies have versions, and every time you update a policy, it keeps the old version. So if you are doing that, and then you have a user who you have given the ability to set the version number on a policy with, then that person, if you gave him root access to begin with, and then you restricted his access later, if that user decides to roll back to a version of the policy where he had higher privileges, that is possible unless you restrict that access. So the first part of this lab is to poke around, to get a policy. So this is, uh, this is what you're going to do. You're going to get some access keys. So the very all of these levels will start by you getting the AWS access keys for some profile. And that will, this is the start of Cloud Goat. You are always given a profile, uh, and then if you click on this link, uh, this profile is for the level as it's deployed on my project. So you would just copy and paste the account ID, no, the access key ID and the secret key, and then uh, in the AWS CLI, you can start using the CLI with the Rainer role uh, associated with it. Okay. Uh, and so if you look at this step, there's very few uh, steps. You're going to look at the attached policies. So you have your credential, and you want to like, what policies are attached to me? So you'll list them. Uh, and then what you'll do is you'll, be, you'll have the policy that's attached to you. Uh, you'll list all of your versions. And then what you can do is get 
each of the individual versions of the policy to figure out what permissions you were given for each version of the policy. You're going to identify the one that gave you full access to everything on that project. And then that's the one you would want to roll back into. But I don't want you to actually roll back. So don't do the set default policy version. Stop there. Because then the level will break for everyone else. Uh, so yeah, stop there. Just do that. Show the policy that you would have rolled back to. And then leave it at that. Questions? Yes? Uh, the CLI you can set up on your own machine. If you wanted your own instantiation of Cloud Goat, if you actually want to use, if you have a legitimate AWS uh, account, then what I would have you do is go to Rhino Security Labs, uh, and you can launch this on your own if you wanted to. So yeah. Um, I can help you a little bit on that. It's been a while since I went through the steps to install all this stuff. But if you actually do want to run Cloud, because there's actually three levels in Cloud Goat that I'm not going to do that are actually pretty cool. So if you do have an AWS account, I would suggest doing those two as well, or two or three. Um, but yeah. Does it count for the final? Yeah, well, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, you could do a couple of those for the final, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll let, but the, so they, they won't take you that long because the walkthrough is there, but yeah, I want, I want, I want it sort of more open-ended stuff for the, for the final, yeah. Um, yeah, the out, whenever it says show, take a screenshot of that. Um, yeah, and then uh, again, no remediation. <laughs> like just, just uh, screenshots where I ask you for them is all I'm looking for. Okay, so I will stop there.